You've probably heard of this game called Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. The idea is that you take any actor or actress and try to think of a way to connect that person to Kevin Bacon through mutual movies and TV shows they might have been in. For example, let's take Aubrey Plaza. Aubrey Plaza was in The Little Hours with John C. Riley. John C. Riley was in Eight with Kevin Bacon. That's just two links. Hmm. Let's try this again. Let's start with Ice T. Ice T was in Luck of the Draw with James Marshall. James Marshall was in A Few Good Men with Kevin Bacon. Just two links again. Now, let's try this on someone who isn't famous. Would it work on me, Eric Vanman, a social neuroscientist in Australia who's never been in a major motion picture? Well, 40 years ago, I had the lead in my high school musical, My Fair Lady, as Professor Higgins, and I did this with a guy named Tim Maculin, who was Colonel Pickering. After we graduated, Tim moved to Los Angeles and appeared in several movies and TV shows. Tim was in Heartbeat with Stephen Gilborn. Stephen Gilborn was in Enormous Changes at the Last Minute with Kevin Bacon. That's just three links. So even me, I'm four degrees of separation from Kevin Bacon? How can this be? And why is Kevin Bacon so essential to all this? Well, in this video, we're taking a deep dive into the whole six degrees of separation thing, which is also known in the sciences as the small world problem. By the end of this video, you will understand the origin of the small world problem, how we know that we're all interconnected in about five to seven links, and exactly how it could possibly work in a world with over eight billion people. Modern society became fascinated with Six Degrees of Separation and its offshoot, the Kevin Bacon game, due to a 1990 play and then a 1993 movie based on that play called Six Degrees of Separation, starring Will Smith and Stalker Channing. One of the characters says the following. I read somewhere that everybody on this planet is separated by only six other people. Six degrees of separation between us and everyone else on this planet. The President of the United States, or gondolier in Venice, just fill in the names. I find that extremely comforting that we're so close, but I also find it like Chinese water torture that we're so close because you have to find the right six people to make the connection. So is that all fiction? Well, not exactly. You see, more than 25 years before the movie, a psychology professor, Stanley Milgram, wrote an article about the small world problem in the very first issue of Psychology Today. In it, Milgram provided the first scientific evidence that all of us are separated from one another by a fairly small number of links. Milgram himself came up with the idea because he had been reading the work of a political scientist at MIT and a computer scientist at IBM who were trying to develop a theoretical model of how any two strangers chosen at random could be linked together through small chains of connections. Milgram was the one who figured out how to go about measuring those connections with a very clever procedure. Before I go on, I have to ask, does the name Stanley Milgram sound familiar to you? Psychology students everywhere will likely recognize his name. He's the famous social psychologist who conducted those controversial electric shock obedience experiments at Yale early in his career, and which I hope to discuss in a future video. A few years later, Milgram moved to Harvard University. According to Thomas Blass's biography of Stanley Milgram, which you can find linked in the description, Milgram no longer wanted to deal with the criticism of how he had treated his participants in the obedience studies, so he had moved on to less controversial topics. This was when he conducted his first studies on the small world problem. Milgram started by choosing the name of a person far away, the target. A group of men and women, called the starters, would then try to send a folder to the target person using only a series of friends and acquaintances. The folder could only be sent to a person the sender knew on a first name basis and who maybe would have a connection to the target. To keep track of the folder's journey, it contained a roster to which each person in the chain added his or her name and tracer postcards to be mailed to Milgram. As reported in the Psychology Today article, for the first study, the target chosen was the wife of a divinity student living in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The starters were a group of people living in Kansas. Amazingly, four days after the study began, the target woman was walking down the street when an instructor at the nearby Episcopal Theological Seminary approached her and said, Alice, and passed her the folder that had started with a wheat farmer back in Kansas. The farmer had passed it to an Episcopalian minister in his hometown, 
who sent it to this minister who taught in Cambridge, who then gave it to the target person. Only three links were required for these four people. In a follow-up study with senders in Nebraska, such chains were found to vary in length from two to 10, with the modal number being five, six people in the chain. So supposedly then, this is where six degrees of separation comes from, even though Milgram never used this term. Milgram and his colleagues published two more scientific papers over the next couple of years, and thus was born the notion that people are, on average, separated by six degrees. Now that's rather incredible, isn't it? With billions of people on the planet, we could all be interconnected in small chains with one another, just like Kevin Bacon is with other movie stars. However, Judith Kleinfeld in 2002 published a paper about Milgram's research that poked a lot of holes in those first studies. She had been attempting to replicate the project with her students at the University of Alaska, where she started to look more carefully at Milgram's papers and notice some problems. First, those random senders in Nebraska, Kansas, and elsewhere were actually chosen from mailing lists Milgram had to buy. One of these lists for Nebraska, for example, was a list of people thinking about buying stocks. And the target in that study happened to be a stockbroker in Boston. Thus, they may already have had a built-in advantage in finding people who might know their target. Second, only a small number of these chains were ever completed. Milgram mentioned this in his Psychology Today article. For example, of the 160 chains in the Nebraska study, 44 were completed and 126 were never finished. In fact, the study in Kansas had just 50 starters for the target of the wife of the divinity student, with only three of those completed, including the example I mentioned already. Other details that Kleinfeld discovered by going through Milgram's papers in the Yale University archives included the fact that those postcards that were sent back to Milgram were printed on thick blue cardboard and embossed with Harvard University in gold letters. The roster was also visually impressive, all designed to ensure people would perhaps work harder to pass on the folder to the next person. In the years since Milgram published his work, the only replications of the studies published were by Milgram himself. In all these studies, most of the senders never got their folder to the target person, leaving the whole project with a success rate of 29% completed chains. Kleinfeld concluded that there wasn't strong evidence for the small world problem for most people on the planet. Instead, it probably reflected the power of social capital and social status. Some people in society may be highly interconnected, like academics who all work on the same scholarly problem, but the majority of the population doesn't really have all these short chains of connection. Now, before you think I'm arguing that we should just chuck the whole small world phenomenon into the dust heap of failed research, let me tell you about the work of Duncan Watts, who is a professor in computational social science at the University of Pennsylvania. While Watts was a graduate student at Cornell in the late 1990s, he and his advisor, Steve Stogratz, began making computer models of small world phenomena. Although their use of graph theory and other related concepts is well outside of my expertise, I can tell you that one of their key insights was that the small world problem may be more about connecting groups of people rather than connecting individuals. Think about this. You could take 100 people that you know, and let's say each of them know 100 people. Already, two degrees of separation away from you, we're talking about 100 times 100, 10,000 people in a network. And if we take those 10,000 people and look at the 100 people that they know, we would be at 1 million people at three degrees of separation. Of course, in the real world, the number of people we know is much, much higher. So it seems incredibly unlikely that you would know any of the other people at three degrees of separation, unless some of them were members of a group of friends with whom you have some association. In other words, when we take into account the very real world phenomenon of it's who you know, we are more likely to be connected to others via clusters of people who went to the same school, go to the same place of worship, work in the same company, etc. And this idea is what Watts was able to model and verify in a study in which he used a large number of people. In a research paper published in Science in 2003, Watts and his colleagues recruited more than 60,000 people to participate in an email version of the original Milgram Small World Technique. Participants first went to a website where they were told they would be a starter and that they had been randomly assigned to one of six possible targets. A professor at an Ivy League university, 
an archival inspector in Estonia, a technology consultant in India, a policeman in Australia, and a veterinarian in the Norwegian Army. They were told to relay a message to their allocated target by passing the message to a social acquaintance whom they considered closer than themselves to the target. They also answered questions about how they knew this person and why they were being sent their message, thus adding some more depth to the analyses. Because only about 37% of the participants started chains, this led to 24,000 chains being created in the project. But in the end, only 384 of those were completed. Of the 384 completed, the average number of connections was four. But because it was probably easier to complete a chain when it was shorter, the authors were able to estimate what the real number might have been if there had been many more chains completed, and they ended up with a number between five and seven for the average chain length. Five seems to be right when the sender and the target are in the same country, whereas seven is closer to what it is if they are in different countries. Somewhat in support of the network models that Watts has developed, you can see here that people relied on medium strength friends that originated in the workplace when trying to find someone to send their email. You can read more about this work in the book Six Degrees by Duncan Watts, published in 2002. In that work, Watts argues that small world networks exist in nature beyond just human social networks, for example, in neural networks of the brain. So what's with Kevin Bacon then? How does he play a role in all of this? Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon was a simple game started by some fraternity brothers at William and Mary College in 1997. Being fans of Mr. Bacon, they believed he was the true center of the movie universe, and they developed the game where people had to come up with links based on their movie knowledge of how a certain actor could be linked to Bacon. The winner would be the person who came up with the shortest chain. However, it turns out that there isn't anything too spectacular about Bacon in all of this. He's been in dozens of movies, but there are others who were in many more. There's a website you can go to called The Oracle of Kevin Bacon, where you can input any two actors' names, including, of course, Kevin Bacon, to see what their degrees of separation are. And it turns out, according to Duncan Watts, that, quote, in a world consisting of hundreds of thousands of actors, every actor could be connected to every other actor in an average of less than four steps. Movie actors comprise their own small world, a cluster of people in the same industry. My own connection to Kevin Bacon through my friend in high school is just a matter of my having chosen to do acting in high school, and of my many classmates with whom I acted, one happened to go to Hollywood and join that small world network of movie actors. The phenomenon of a surprisingly low number of connections between people, despite the vast global population, is a testament to the structure and nature of social networks. Here's a summary of what we know about the small world phenomenon. First, clustered networks with outliers. People tend to form clusters. These are groups where each person knows many others within the same group, like family, friends, coworkers, etc. However, there are always a few individuals who bridge between multiple clusters. These bridges dramatically reduce the steps needed to connect disparate groups. Two, there's exponential growth of connections. As I mentioned earlier, even if you knew only 100 people in your life, and each of them knew 100 people, you would quickly be connected to 10,000 people. This grows exponentially with each additional degree of separation. Three, globalization and technology. With the rise of international travel, global commerce, and especially the internet and social media, individuals are forging connections across greater distances and cultures than ever before. Fourth, Cultural and historical ties. Shared languages and cultural events, migrations, historical events, and even global phenomena like popular TV shows or sporting events serve as nodes that connect large swaths of the global population. Five, influential nodes. Some individuals, like celebrities or prominent figures in various fields, are connected to a vast number of people, directly or indirectly. They act as super connectors, further reducing the average degrees of separation. My friend Tim is certainly like that, as some of my colleagues are in academia who've collaborated with many other people. And six, random acquaintances. Think about all the fleeting acquaintances one might have, from someone you met while traveling to a distant relative or a friend you made during a workshop. These random connections often bridge the gap between otherwise distant clusters. So next time you're in a room with strangers, remember, you're not that distant. In about six steps or fewer, you could be connected to someone in this room or even on the other side of the world. Our world is vast, 
but the six degrees of separation reminds us of our intricate, beautiful interconnectedness. I'd love to hear from you. Leave a comment below about your own experiences with the small world phenomenon. What about you and me? Do you think we are only separated by a few degrees? Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more insights into psychology and neuroscience. Until next time, stay curious. Bye.